This lesson is on periodic functions. And in brief, a periodic function is just a function that repeats itself as the input is varied. It's something that repeats, and that's gonna become much more clear, I think, in a slide or two when we look at some pictures. But to start off giving you a few quick examples, um, I can mention the following things. Uh, displacement of a plucked violin string. So you take a string instrument, you pluck a string on it, it vibrates back and forth um, in some sort of regular way, and that's an example of a periodic function. The electrical activity in a heart beating at a constant pulse. So when your heart is doing things right, um, you have a pulse that beats pretty regularly, and one way that doctors uh, and other healthcare professionals study this is with an electrocardiogram, which measures the electrical activity in your heart as it beats with that regular pulse, and it'll make it, that, that EKG will make a pretty um, regular looking periodic function on a piece of paper. Uh, the number of hours of light in the day across the span of a year. That's something else that repeats itself over the span of a year in that case. So these are periodic functions, and we should talk about some of their most fundamental properties. The first one I'll mention is amplitude, okay? An amplitude basically measures how tall a periodic function is. It's half the difference of the maximum value and the minimum value of the function. So for this graph here that I've shown you, um, we see a periodic function, its maximum value is at 1.25, its minimum value is down here at about minus 1.45, um, and so we take half the difference of those two things and we find an amplitude of about 1.35, estimating from the graph. Another really important property of periodic functions is their period, and the period is how long it takes the function to repeat its pattern one time. Another way of saying that is, by how much do you have to increase the independent variable to get through one cycle, one repetition, one full repetition of the pattern? So we look at this picture and we see this pattern that kind of, kind of repeats itself. You start here, you go up and down and up and all the way down and back up, and then that's one unit of the pattern and then it repeats. And so to get from here to here was five units of time. To get from here to here was five more units of time, and so on. And so we say the period of this periodic function is five. All right, uh, some of the most fundamental periodic functions are the trigonometric functions, sine and cosine. And you might be familiar with these from your high school algebra or pre-calculus or trig class. Um, I'm showing you pictures of sine and cosine here. This one's cosine, this one's sine. Um, and one thing I want you to notice is that these are identical functions, except that they're shifted by a certain amount. So for instance, if I took this cosine function and I focused on this peak and I shifted it over to here, these two graphs would lie on top of each other. So sine and cosine look almost the same, but they're shifted a little bit. I want to explain to you now what are some of the important parameters in the family of functions defined by sine and cosine. So the function we're going to consider is a sine. It would be a pretty similar story for a cosine. Okay, but we're going to consider this function a sine omega t plus phi plus a constant c. And we'll go through each of these four parameters, a, omega, phi, and c, in turn and talk about what they do. And A is the amplitude, and I've already told you what amplitude is. Um, I'll show you uh, another example here with pictures. So I'm going to fix omega, phi, and C at these values, and I'm going to show you this function for different values of A. So here's what the picture looks like for A equals 1. Here's A equals 0.5. You can notice that the function got shorter from top to bottom. Here's 0.1. It's even shallower. On the other hand, if I increase up to 1.5, I get a function that's even taller from top to bottom than my original value of a equals 1. And here's the final example, uh, a equals 2.0. That's the tallest one here on the graph. So that's what changing a amplitude does. Now let's talk about the frequency. So frequency is this Greek letter omega. Sometimes in physics, this will be referred to as the angular frequency. And the main point, uh, I think the best way to understand frequency is perhaps this relationship here. It says frequency is inversely proportional to period and the constant of proportionality is 2 pi. So what does this say? If the period of a function gets longer, the frequency goes down. I'll say that again. If the function takes longer to repeat, the frequency goes down. 
On the other hand, if the function takes a shorter range of the input variable to repeat, it's a smaller period, then the frequency goes up. So in the end, the frequency essentially controls how fast does this function wiggle. So I'm going to fix a omega, uh, sorry, a phi and c at these three values, and we'll vary omega. So here's a picture uh, for omega equals one. And if I increase, uh, sorry, if I decrease omega, we see a slower wiggle. So we went from having um, two full repetitions of our pattern in this picture to one full repetition here. If I decrease omega even more, down to 0.5, I only get half a repetition of the whole pattern. All right, on the other hand, if I increase omega up to two, I get uh, four repetitions of the pattern. So bigger omega, faster wiggling, we fit more wiggles into the same size graph here, okay? And here's the fastest one I'll show you, omega equals four. And here's what they look like all put together in the same muddled graph. Okay, so omega controls, the frequency controls the, uh, kind of speed with which the graph wiggles. Now phi is referred to as a phase, and what changing phi does is cause a horizontal shift. The amount of horizontal shift in the graph isn't equal to phi, it's ac actually equal to phi over omega. So I'm going to fix a, omega, and c at these values, and I'm going to plot a function here um, with uh, phi equals zero, Okay? And what I'm going to do is track the horizontal position at which the maximum occurs. Okay? So we're asking um, for the function um, a sine omega t plus phi, where's the maximum of that function? And for these values, it's at x equals about 0.79 on the graph. And what I'm going to do now is start changing phi. So if I change phi to be 1, I claim that we should have a horizontal shift of one divided by omega. Well, omega is two here. That should be a horizontal shift of a half. And indeed, that peak moved leftwards from 0.79, that was around here, to 0.29, where it is here. If I change phi even more, I can shift it by, uh, I can increase phi by another unit to be phi equals two. And this peak moves to the left another unit, uh, another half unit, another 0 0.5 to the left. All right, on the other hand, if I instead started here, this is back to my base value of phi equals zero, and if I instead increase phi, sorry, decrease phi, make it negative, I shift to the right. And since I made phi negative one, I have a shift to the right of one over two, or a half, okay? So I can show you all of these together on the same picture, but the long and the short of it is that the size of the shift is phi over omega, and if phi is positive, um, I'm going to end up shifting to the left, and if it's negative, I'll shift to the right. Finally, C is the vertical shift. So I'm going to fix A, omega, and phi at these values. I'm going to show you graphs of the function, starting with C equals zero. Notice that this function is sort of centered around a vertical value of zero, okay? And what I will do now is increase c to one, shifts the whole graph up a unit. Here's a unit more for c equals two. If I make c negative, it shifts the graph downwards. There's c equals negative one and c equals negative two. Now let's conclude with a little modeling example. And this is something I mentioned earlier in the screencast. It's the example of modeling the number of daylight hours in a day across the span of a year. The shortest day of the year is December 22, that's the 356th day, and there are eight hours of daylight on that day, it's the dead of winter. Longest day of the year is June 21, that's the 172nd day, and this is in the height of the summer, there are 16 hours of daylight on that day. And we'd like to come up with a function that models the number of daylight hours on day T of the year. So I'm just gonna pick something. I'm gonna pick the most general, kind of simple periodic function I can think of. We could choose a cosine or a sine. I'm gonna choose a cosine. You can absolutely choose a sine. You'll get a slightly different answer for the problem, but it'll be mathematically equivalent. So if you plotted my answer and your answer, if you chose sine, they'll look the exact same. I'm gonna choose a function of this form. And first we'll ask what the amplitude is. Amplitude should be half the maximum value minus the minimum value of the function. Well, the maximum value is 16 hours of daylight. The minimum value is eight hours of daylight. So the amplitude is one half of 16 minus eight, which is four, okay? So you can go ahead up here and remember that this A is actually equal to four now, okay?
Then we can try to figure out what c, the vertical shift, is. Now we know where the maximum of the function is. The maximum, as we said, is at a height of 16. If c were 0, the maximum would be at 4, a height of 4, because the amplitude is 4. But we don't want it to be at 4. We want it to be at 16. That means we have to shift it up by 12. Right? So another way of saying that is that c equals 16, which is our maximum value, minus the value of the amplitude. 16 minus 4 is 12, and that's what we'll choose for this vertical shift. All right? Then we can think about the period, and here we'll just use the fact that this pattern should repeat over the course of a year. A year is 365 days, so by definition of frequency, frequency is 2 pi over the period, so we'll take frequency equals 2 pi over 365. So this frequency is going to be 2 pi over 365. All right, then we can think about the uh, phase phi and the horizontal shift that it causes. If phi were 0, we would have a cosine function that was unshifted horizontally, and cosine's maximum occurs at t equals 0. On the other hand, our shift occurs 172 days to the right, right? Or our maximum occurs 172 days to the right. That means we need for our shift to be rightwards by 172 units. Um, we know that to shift to the right, we want a negative phase. So I write negative 172 equals phi over omega. We know what omega is, so it's simple to solve for phi. It turns out to be negative 172 times 2 pi over 365. So now we know this value of phi here too. Okay? We take those values of a, omega, phi, and c, we put them all into the function, we get this expression here, and if you want to simplify it a little bit, you can notice that these two terms inside the cosine both have a factor of 2 pi over 365. You can factor it out to get this final form here that models the number of daylight hours on day t of the year. All right, so we've come to the end of this lesson, and I want to ask yourself if you can do the following things. Explain periodic functions and words, equations, and graphs. Describe the effects of varying parameters in basic trigonometric functions, sine and cosine. And assess whether given data or a given situation is periodic. And if so, come up with a simple model for it. All right, thanks very much.